is my promise. So I'm back on this bathroom floor again. And it's the middle of the night again. And flashes of your face keep me up again. It's you, Abigail. You have stained my soul. Is it a street worker? Is it a sex worker? You tell me, what is the politically correct way to say that my 11-year-old friend Abigail is a war orphaned prostitute? Yes, this $2 hooker, this child, she opens her legs to men so that she can stay alive. And right now, I'm not sure if she's alive. And when I think about her, I don't have the words to describe. My friend Abigail is missing. She is gone. She is nowhere to be found. And when I call her name, nobody knows her. Her community tells me matter-of-factly that she's missing. Her country shushes me. It's not good for their reputation. My country tells me it's not polite to talk about her. Here she is the blame of a corrupt government in a country that people know nothing about. Here she is just another abstract thought that would never cross someone's mind on a line to purchase a cup of coffee that costs more than she would make selling herself for one day. Here she is just another Facebook cause that people might check they like because it's trendy or because it's easy. She is the bottom of the earth to a world that has been brutal to her, that has beat her up and raped her in ways that people who could read would never be able to pronounce. Now this small child is gone and I've promised her that I would come and find her and I can't. So I'm up again on this bathroom floor again and it's the middle of the night again and I need to scream her name. Abigail, where are you? I'm trying to find you. I haven't forgotten you. I am struggling to find words to talk about you. People here are offended by you, disturbed by you. I am too. You keep me up at night. And I hope that you always do. You are my vow, my promise. I'm coming to get you. To give you a little context um, of how I ended up in Liberia and how I met Abigail, I grew up in this town called Bernardsville, New Jersey. It's like 30 miles outside of Manhattan. The king of Morocco, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Mike Tyson, Whitney Houston, they owned estates where I'm from. It was like one of the wealthiest communities in America. Actually, Mark Echo lives in Burnersville. Hey, Mark. And, uh, but my mom was a single mom of three who worked an overnight shift making minimum wage. And I was a free lunch kid. And on top of that, there was a lot of abuse. It wasn't just poverty. When I was eight years old, I found my uncle dead next to me of a heroin overdose. My sister raised me. She's four years older than me, Liz. And... And when, we were in, when she got to high school, she dropped out and she was on the streets doing whatever she could do to get her next high. My older sister, my hero, became a crack addict. And partially to escape all the crazy chaos that was going on in my house, I got really involved in this youth group. And we would do all kinds of things. We would go to old folks' homes and I'd play guitar like Phoebe from Friends and <laughs> would sing to the old, you know, old people. And, and they were going to Haiti, and I wanted to go. I'd never really left New Jersey, to be honest with you. Barely left my town. And my town was my world. That's like all I knew. When you're a kid, your, your world is where, what you see. And in my head, the world was extremely wealthy. And somehow, I ended up getting like the crap end of the stick. And I'm like, what the F? <laughs> and th my youth group was going to Haiti. So I was like, oh, well, I want to, I'm like, I want to help. So I made a sign call, said, that said, send Katie to Haiti. And I stood outside of grocery stores and I asked people to help me, and they did. And I got there and I learned the craziest statistics. I learned that 88% of the world lives in developing countries, or that the majority of the world doesn't have access to their basic human rights. Things like clean drinking water, education, healthcare. And I was like, holy crap, I'm one of the world's wealthiest people. And my whole worldview flipped upside down. And I was like, I have to do something about this. So I was the first person in my family to go to college. I got this Bill Clinton Service Award for, for, doing, um, for this for service. 
And I did my internship working in Bolivia and my first job out of college, I applied to work for this thing called, it was similar to Peace Corps and they sent me to Liberia. And to be honest with you, I had to like Google Liberia on a map, or I mean, Google Liberia, where is this place? I couldn't find it on a map. And you learn these statistics, you learn all this history. I don't know if you knew this, but Liberia means liberty. Freed American slaves form the country. It has um, an American flag with one star instead of 50. And it's this strong connection to the United States. But it also was, if you've seen the movie Blood Diamond, has anybody seen Blood Diamond? That's Liberia and Sierra Leone. So one of the most horrific wars that ever took place on our pl planet happened there in Liberia. So I was living with 86 children whose parents were brutally murdered in war. Many of them forced to watch it and they're like telling me these stories. I was running literacy, uh, an adult literacy program and watching people write their names for the first time. And I'm a city person. I love energy, I love people, I like diversity, and I really like pizza. So I would go as much as I could, and this is my friend Oma Kortu, and I, I'd bring her chocolate cake. I would go to the city to get her chocolate cake and eat pizza. And when I would get to the city, I would make friends with all these kids. And these kids would tell me, you know, we, I'm a big kid myself, so we'd be like drawing donkeys in the sand, and I'd be throwing kids in the ocean, and we would spin and spin and spin and spin and spin and spin until we'd fall on the ground, and I would look these kids in the eyes, and I would say, kids like Abigail. And I would say, if you could have anything in the entire world, what would it be? And over and over again, these kids were like, our biggest dream is just to go to school. And to be honest with you, I didn't really like school growing up, but I, so I started to understand if they weren't in school, they had to be, they were working. And if they were a girl and they were working, oftentimes they would end up being sexually exploited. So I was using social media, MySpace was cool back in the day, and I would, you know, to tell their stories. And people were wiring me money to Liberia. And I would take the money and put kids in school. At first it was seven kids, then it turned to 30. And this New York City tax attorney, she saw what I was doing and she's like, you should really start your own organization and I'll do the paperwork for you for free. And I remember going to my friend feeling like, I'm not the type of person that starts anything. I'm not Ivy League. I, you know, where am I gonna get the money from? I was afraid. I'm not smart enough, celebrity enough, pretty enough, this enough, that enough. And my best friend gave me the, the best advice you could ever give anyone in your entire life, the best advice I ever got. He said, Katie, get over yourself. It's not about you. And it's true, I still have to say that over, I'm scared to get on the stage. Get over yourself, get over yourself, it's not about you. And that's where the name More Than Me ended up coming from. And More Than Me is, a, you know, getting over ourselves and living for something bigger than ourselves. And so the president of Liberia heard about what we were doing and she said, thank you for serving the children of Liberia. As long as you're serving the children for free, you can have this building. And like gives me this like bombed out, looted building. I'm like, wow, great. How am I going to fix this thing up? And you know, doing you know, doing events and as much as I could to raise money. And I ended up on this primetime television show. It was NBC, and I had to get the most amount of Facebook likes. I was the smallest organization of 25. We had a $5,000 marketing budget, and we're up against people with 10, you know, 10 million dollar budgets in total. And we ended up winning the competition. And Joe McCall told me, you should have a, a career in screaming. <laughs> so we went back and we built the first free girls, um, tuition-free girls academy in Liberia. And it was pretty exciting. It was one of the best days of my life. <laughs> Woo! The president came and we cut the ribbon and it was so amazing. And it wasn't just a school, it's everything that a girl, you know, addresses everything a girl faces. You know, we had to provide meals and we have a health clinic. We have qualified teachers and after school programs. And the, and the most important thing, we have love. We really love these kids. And we, we, you know, our results were showing that we were becoming the best school in the country. And we're like, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. Thinking about all these dreams for the future. And the worst thing that could have happened, happened. Ebola hit. And I didn't even know what Ebola was. You know, you're like, where does this thing come from? You know, and it, it, at first it was far away. And then before I knew, I was in New York City for a board meeting. And I remember seeing this picture at the end of the community where I work called West Point was being quarantined. And I was like, I saw one of my girls, one of my students in the picture, even though we had told them to stay away from crowds. There they were in the middle of the crowds, Albernita. And I told my board, I said, I'm going back. And, and I'm like, I can't, I can't sit here and wait to hear what's gonna happen. So we took 15 bags of medical supplies. I'll never forget being on that plane. It was like me and a CDC person. I'm like, what are we doing here? And the first thing I did when I got on the ground was I, I went to the, to the guys with machine guns that were quarantining the community and I said, 
I'll give you some medical supplies and gloves if you let me go in. And so I bribed them to let me go into the community and I went and, and met every single one of my kids, this is Susan, making sure that they were safe and they were. I went to Doctors Without Borders and said, can you come and train staff? Can you tell us how we can fight this on the front lines? Tell us how to protect ourselves. Begging them to come and I said, the community is where you need to be. They had a hospital and they were doing a great job, but we really needed your help in the community. And then, and then I asked, the, we turned our school into um, an Ebola outreach command center and we had all the, these medical supplies and we did trainings in the school. And I asked the community, why, what's the problem? Why is this growing so fast? Why are there so many thousands of people with Ebola? and they said we call for an ambulance and the ambulance comes in four or five days there were three ambulances in the country for for four million people so we bought three ambulances and we were able to turn the, the response rate um, to for the phone calls from from four days to 15 minutes then we trained our staff we ended up by um, we ended up hiring a bunch of home health care nurses we had over 500 people on staff and we had people, it was, it was a partnership. Many people came together and it was amazing. And, and in our kindergarten class, you can see we're being trained on how to put on and take off protective gear. And, and one of the coolest things that we were able to do is that there were children everywhere that were abandoned in the streets and we were able to bring them in. And for that, we were recognized as the Time Magazine Person of the Year. But what was cooler, cooler than that was the community came out in a parade with signs that said the world ran out on us and you ran in and it was really beautiful and extremely touching but we wanted to catalyze that platform and make sure that this would never happen again but I will never forget even though we helped save thousands of lives I'll never forget those that that didn't make it this is Charlie sweet Charlie who was eight years old and he was in his, you know, this is right outside of the treatment unit. There were no beds left inside. And here's a little boy. His parents are gone. He's all by himself in his own feces. I had to cut the picture off because, you know, he has no clothes on. And I'm, I'm giving him water. I'm trying to tell him everything that I can say to encourage him. And you know what he said to me? He looked at me and he tried to encourage me. He said, and God will bless you for what you're doing. This is what this little boy say. While he's dying, I'm singing to him. And this is Sarah. And I look in her eyes, she's 10 years old. I gave her two teddy bears and a telephone and I looked her dead in the face and I said, you're gonna make it, you're gonna be okay. And she trusted me. Sarah stopped answering her phone. One of the hardest things I've ever had to do in my entire life was go to her mother and tell her that Sarah didn't make it. I knew after six months on the front lines of Ebola that we couldn't just turn the page on these people that something had to be done to make sure this would never ever happen again. And the number one reason that, this, that Ebola had the toll that it did in West Africa is because of the broken infrastructures. So I went to the Minister of Education and I said, you know, we have one of the best schools in the country, he knows that. I said, how can we help rebuild the education system? 100% fail rate, even the president said that this, you know, she said that the, there's no education system or the, she called this education system a mess. So they asked us to scale our school from one school to 30 schools and that led to the, this has never been done before. What we're doing in Liberia in supporting and joining with the Ministry of Education is we're creating the largest public-private partnership in the world and it's super exciting. Um, <laughs> so our goal is in the next five years, we're gonna be, we'll have 500 schools, 500 more than me public schools. Um, and and the, whole, um, the whole partnership is gonna extend to every single child in Liberia. It's gonna take $50 million, which seems like the craziest thing in the whole world, but it's not. <laughs> We've already halfway there, which is so exciting. <laughs> Woo! So like Nelson Mandela always said, it always seems impossible until it's done. There's so many times over and over again where it seems impossible when we've done it. So um, here we go. So we say, let's just do it. And I wanted to leave you with this. And this is a theme I keep hearing over and over again. I'll never forget being on the, there's death all around us, being on the front lines of Ebola and we're waiting for the experts. When are the heroes coming? When are the experts coming? Until we realized we are the heroes. We are the experts. Nobody's coming to save us. And that's our world. No one is coming to save our world. The problems in our world are up to, it, solving them is up to us, regular people. We made this song and it goes, 
I am the hero, you are the hero, we are the heroes. I am the hero, you are the hero, we are the heroes. <laughs> They're telling me to wrap up, so otherwise we would keep singing. But if you're interested, we really need you. We're calling on all heroes here. If you would like to be a part of this movement and you would be a part of, of creating history, we would love to join you. We need your support and your help. This is happening and we want you to be a part of this. Join people like Warren Buffett and some pretty other, and, uh, and Roman and the Patel crew, right? Um, and you can send me an email, let's make history together. I love you. Thank you. Thank you.